So about two years ago, I returned to Columbia. I was here in the, the mid 2000s as a maternal fetal medicine fellow and returned to create an initiative around environmental health or around the environment and health, something that we have called the Collaborative for Women's Environmental Health. And through the support of a generous philanthropic gift, our initiative has been able to tackle things that are outside the confines of typical academic medicine. So not only are we thinking about environmental health with respect to clinical care, with respect to research, but we've really been able to to uh, dig into some initiatives that we might not otherwise been able to do without that uh, gift. But before I get into the collaborative, I thought I would start with um, explaining why there's a need for an environmental health initiative in an academic department, and then a little bit of my own background on how I got interested in this topic. So um, the rationale for the collaborative, one is that women's health is, is linked with environmental exposures, um, environmental exposures and increasingly to the effects of climate change. So if we look throughout the field uh, of women's health in OBGYN, almost every single condition that we care about um, has strong links with the environment. I'm a maternal fetal medicine physician, as I uh, said earlier. So my focus has been uh, a little bit on uh, maybe entirely on pregnancy and not some of the other parts of our field. But if you look at GYN cancers, infertility, uh, endometriosis, fibroids, there is an uh, exploding literature on the links with environmental exposures and how this is contributing to disease. Secondly, many of these health conditions, um, our ability to prevent them or treat them is quite limited. And we don't seem to be doing a very good job over time with improving outcomes. And that is not to say that there haven't been tremendous uh, advances in our field. You can think about the explosion of genetics, which is a real strength of our department, IVF, uh, treatments for uh, female cancers. Again, it's not that, that nothing has happened, but there are many of the conditions like preterm birth where we haven't been able to move the needle. And if we want to, we need to be thinking upstream, thinking of the environment. It's also important to us in this field that we try to optimize health for all of our patients. And we know that there are these significant disparities um, for some patients compared to others. And a lot of the contributors to these inequities come from the environment. If we are trying to optimize health and achieve health equity, we need to be thinking upstream um, and thinking about how to redress these environmental contributors to disease. That's kind of the rationale for the collaborative. But some of you may be asking yourselves, what, what does that mean by environmental health? It's not the health of the environment. We're not talking about the health of the trees or the forests or nature, but rather how the environment around us contributes to human health and well-being. Basically, anything that's extrinsic to us is the environment. Um, so anything beyond genes and genetics is really the environment. And it's thought that the differences in our external environment actually account for most of our disease risk. 70 to 90% is uh, estimated to be associated with the environment. <clears throat> what are these exposures? This is a non-exhaustive list. We're talking about environmental exposures like heavy metals that we can be exposed to in our drinking water, plastics, consumer products, personal exposure, personal care products like shampoos, cosmetics. Um, our food is contaminated by pesticides. Um, our food is actually contaminated by plastics from, from uh, the process of, of, of uh, generating a lot of the food. Flame retardants uh, are sort of ubiquitous and they're put on, on products probably don't need to be on. Uh, other industrial chemicals. Uh, we are increasingly thinking about uh, other exposures that are related to climate, like air pollution, heat. Uh, even stress can be considered uh, an environmental exposure. So when you when you think about that, it's sort of overwhelming what potentially can be contributing to disease. 
this is some data that's nationally representative. Um, and it's basically show it's a bit old, but it shows that uh, almost everyone in the United States is exposed to these environmental chemicals. Some of some of the ones that I I listed on the the um, the slide before. So over ninety percent of us have in our uh, in our bodies uh, exposures to these uh, environmental contaminants that have a potential for reproductive harm. Uh, it's also important to know that that our regulatory framework to look at chemicals in this country is woefully inadequate. And if you compare it to drugs, which is the column on the left, it, there's a lot of stuff that a new pharmaceutical will go through before it makes it to the market. That is not so for new chemicals introduced into the market. Uh, there are about 80,000 chemicals already in production in the US with 700 new chemicals being introduced each year. And while it is true that our government through the EPA has the authority to regulate uh, toxic chemicals since the 1970s, they have exercised that authority less than 200 times. And many, many of the times the chemical structure of plastics, other environmental exposures are very similar to pharmaceuticals. So the, the, the classic example is uh, bisphenol A or BPA, um, which was in a competition, if you will, with diethyl stilbesterol to treat miscarriage. And it didn't win out. DES um, was what was taken and used and purposed for a pharmaceutical. But BPA then, because it was a little bit weaker than DES, was repurposed uh, in plastics as a plasticizer. And so we know DES causes significant reproductive harm. And we've been learning that exposures to BPA, which all of us uh, are exposed to, may be causing uh, similar, uh, maybe not quite as severe, but similar issues to our reproductive health. I think it's worth pausing and thinking that, you know, when I was in high school and college, the environment was not really connected to health. It was sort of nature versus man. There was this big um, public uh, outcry of, uh, you know, the loggers, the humans versus the tree huggers that the wanted to protect the habitat of the owl. And I think that that did a disservice for uh, to us for a while because we weren't making these connections that how our health is so inextricably linked with the environment as well. Um, so that's kind of the background of, you know, why we should be thinking increasingly about the environment. It's not to, not to say that genetics isn't important. And again, this is a real uh, pride point for our department is how strong we are in, in genetics. The two are going to be interacting. And I think the future will be understanding what environmental exposures can do um, and the background uh, and interactions with our own uh, genes. So this was a, a homecoming for me. As I said, I was, I was here in the early 2000s as a maternal fetal medicine fellow and came back um, uh, just recently in the last two years to, to found this collaborative. But how, you know, a little bit more of the background, how in the world I got interested in environmental health, so to speak. So when I was a fellow here, um, I was pursuing a degree in um, public health and part of the requirements was intro to environmental health. I think I probably rolled my eyes at this requirement, thinking it was about, you know, people who shop at Whole Foods and, um, you know, I just went in with a probably a very poor attitude. And it was the most fascinating class perhaps I've ever taken and just opened my eyes to the possibility of all different exposures impacting our health. And there was this, this uh, professor who was focused on cooking fires. So uh, most of the world uses biomass fuel. So they cook or heat their homes with things like wood, cow dung, um, you know, dried uh, grasses. And when you light those biomass fuels on fire, they do not uh, burn very efficiently. So there's a lot of pollutants that are uh, uh, released. And so at the time I was really obsessed with malaria and working internationally, but listening to this, this 
uh, lecture, it just hit me that maybe cooking fires was a bigger exposure than even malaria was. So I went up after the lecture, introduced myself to the professor. And as with most careers, things have these sort of serendipitous or circuitous uh, pathways and got invited to, to be part of their biomass working group, which we eventually got funding to do a randomized trial looking at improved cooking interventions during pregnancy, a study called GRASS or the Guyana Randomized Air Pollution and Health Study. So um, again, you know, from just a chance introduction, um, how it really was able to kind of launch my interest and in, initially in household air pollution are cooking fires. I'm not gonna belabor the graphs trial for you, but I think it does um, show hmm. some interesting, uh, interesting points that can be applied to other environmental exposures. We kind of think about environmental exposures as being something you can't randomize uh, people too, you wouldn't, you know, try to have a participant in a research study sign up to be exposed to something, but you can design studies where you randomize interventions that you hope will reduce exposures and can learn a little bit about whether those interventions work, as well as understanding the, you know, the exposure response or how the exposure impacts the outcome. And, and it's a way to do kind of observational research as well as interventional research as well. So in graphs, we um, introduced three different cooking strategies to pregnant individuals, randomizing those strategies at the level of the community, but the only uh, people who uh, were cooking with the different strategies were the pregnant women in our trial. So the control arm was uh, people were continuing to cook with the three stone uh, fire using wood. Um, in one in, in one of our intervention arms, uh, the pregnant women were cooking with this improved wood burning stove, uh, something called the BioLite. Uh, we designed it uh, with our Ghanaian colleagues to have colors that would be uh, appealing to the women. And in fact, the design with the, you know, the, the women considered this a waste. So they found that uh, to be appealing as opposed to some of the other clunkier designs. And our third arm was the sort of cleanest of the arms um, and women who were in LPG communities were cooking with those uh, gas stoves. Um, what we found was that the intervention didn't work when you looked at it um, in those three groups that we didn't see any impact on birth weight, which was one of our uh, primary outcomes, or in uh, improving pneumonia in the first year of life, which is the, the biggest killer of young kids. So if you looked at the results just by arm, um, there wasn't any improvement. So something we call a null trial. However, when you looked at the exposure response and you we did very detailed measurement of air pollution during the pregnancy, we did find that um, exposures were harmful and that um, increasing exposure to the air pollutants reduced birth weight and increased infant pneumonia in that first year of life. So even though the trial was null, we learned a lot um, and you know how that applies to public policy is that maybe uh, the interventions need to be deployed across the entire community, not just to the pregnant individuals, but that even modest reductions in exposure might have huge public health benefits. Um, so a way to connect the research to policy um, was you know, the, the, the biggest take home point from, uh, from this study, not that air pollution is fine, but that um, the interventions that we had proposed weren't good enough. And probably because um, the communities we were working in, the households were close together. So um, someone who was randomized in the study might be in a household next to someone without a pregnant individual who was still cooking with their smoky fire. So that's kind of the background on how I got interested in environmental exposures. However, you may say, how in the world does that relate to someone who practices in the U.S.? And how does that connect to something uh, that requires an initiative within an academic OBGYN department currently? 
Um, I, again, as careers often go, uh, the next part of my story is also a little bit serendipitous. Um, this is probably now about five or eight years ago. Uh, there is a group called the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit Network, which is a mouthful. It's called PESU. I think about it as a poison control center for environmental exposures. So the pediatricians have had this in existence nationally for you know decades, um, mostly responsive to lead toxicity, uh, but it has expanded to other environmental exposures. And about eight to 10 years ago, the national PESU said, everyone in your region, there are 10 regions, you need someone in OBGYN or reproductive health to join your team because we recognize that exposures can happen before birth and contribute to childhood health. Well, everyone went around scrambling for to find someone who was an OBGYN who know, knew something about environmental health. And in my region, which was uh, at the time the Northeast, um, the best they could come up with was some was me, was someone who's been studying, you know, cow dung on fire in rural Ghana. Um, I was completely not prepared um, and not at all an expert to be translating all these other environmental exposures into advice for uh, pregnant women. Um, again, underscoring that there was this big gap and it really lit uh, kind of an idea in my head that we need to be doing a better job as OBGYNs um, tr you know, during our training years, understanding, uh, paying attention to the environment and being able to translate it for our patients. The pediatricians have done a better job in part, uh, they have a, a discipline on environmental health, again, that, uh, that grew up around lead toxicity and the clinical need for chelation. Um, so, so I guess that long-winded story is sort of how I got uh, interested in, in environmental exposures, first from international work and then recognizing this huge gap uh, domestically. Back to kind of the premise that things we care about, um, we're not terribly good at preventing and preterm birth is an example. Um, so here in the U.S., when someone comes in preterm labor, we try very hard to keep them pregnant. Um, we have medications that we use to try to stop contractions. We give them medications to uh, mature the lungs uh, if the infant is born early. And we don't do a great job. Like I showed that graph before, preterm birth has not really changed much uh, in the U.S. with the exception of higher order multiples, um, we've been a little bit better about IVF practices nationally than we were in the past. So what is it that's contributing to preterm birth and how do we make an impact? Uh, again, I think we need to be thinking about the upstream, partnering with policymakers um, who can impact uh, exposure that might have uh, you know, importance with respect to air pollution, I mean, with respect to preterm birth. And here's just a graph globally showing the percentage of preterm births attributable to air pollution. Um, and you can see uh, some parts of the world that are drastically high. And even here in the US, um, the, the part shaded black of which New York City is one, the attributable uh, proportion of preterm births uh, secondary to air pollution is uh, 5% or more. So one in 20 births are uh, related to air pollution. We've made uh, great strides in this country in cleaning up the air. And between the time that I was a, a fellow in the early 2000s to now, the air quality in New York has improved dramatically. There have been uh, policies in place to reduce idling, um, to improve vehicular admissions at the national level. So we've we've actually made progress in cleaning up the air. Um, unfortunately, climate change and the associated wildfires um, are sort of set to erase those gains in air quality. And so this is just a map, um, you know, over the last two decades, showing smoke contribution to overall uh, air particulate matter. Um, and there's been a, a great increase in, in uh, air pollution that's related to wildfire smoke uh, as opposed to traffic. So climate change is really driving this increase in wildfires 
because temperatures are rising, the snow melts sooner, forests are drier. They're really just a powder keg um, set to go off. And when I returned to Colombia, the last thing that I thought would be, you know, the first environmental uh, disaster or emergency was a wildfire. I mean, that is just not what was on my um, radar for what what climate or even environmental exposures the city would be, um, uh, you know, th threatened with. But this is, you know, a picture from the city in June of 2023 from the, the wildfires in Canada. And you can just see the drastic increase in per fine particulate matter exposure. You can see it with your eyes and you can see it on that graph. And so we tried um, in the collaborative to, to come up pretty quickly with ad advice that we could give our patients. There have been um, some studies looking at uh, wildfire smoke exposure and pregnancy outcomes. This comes from California, where they're they're uh, more accustomed to wildfires, showing that there are these negative impacts on pregnancy health, increasing the risk of preterm birth by half a percent, three and a half percent by the time the wildfire is done. And so, what do we tell our patients? We know that there are risks. What happens with the air quality? Um, and so, we tried to quickly put together an educational fact sheet that our clinicians could share with their patients, providing you know where they could go for more information and just some basic um, suggested interventions, wearing an N95 mask if, if you're outside when the air quality is particularly poor, thinking about having an air filter in your home, how to make one if you uh, don't have access to one, staying indoors. And we even you know, flipped some of our uh, office appointments to telehealth during the worst of those, those times. So again, not something that I had predicted would be the first environmental uh, emergency, so to speak, um, but one that uh, you know, quickly became something that people were grasping for information. And I think while we have these fact sheets available on our website, um, I think the future would be even better if we were able to push these out through our patient portals. So we can see you know, if the air quality in the, in the city hits a certain threshold, we can be sitting, sending out these messages to our patients, just like we do to get your you know, flu vaccine, those kinds of reminders, we can be uh, pushing uh, information to them. Um, other things that you know are increasingly important to us as we think about the warming climate, uh, the group that I worked with in Ghana, I'm still working with today, um, and we've been able to look and think about um, how heat um, exposure has impacted pregnancy outcomes. So leveraging some of the, the data that we um, gathered during the graph study, we went back and combined it with climate data and looked at how heat exposure was impacting pregnancy outcomes. Um, most of the data on heat and, and pregnancy outcomes comes from higher income country settings like ours, where people may have access to indoor cooling, which is not the case in, in rural, uh, rural Ghana. And what we showed was that um, an increasing average uh, maximum temperatures during the second and third trimesters of pregnancy was associated with an uh, increase in the, the, the risk for preterm birth. And if you did a little bit of a back of the envelope calculation, um, you could see that a warming environment in, in places like Ghana, where you don't have access to indoor cooling, um, could quickly translate into many more preterm births um, in these populations. But it's not just globally that heat is distributed inequitably. This is a map of New York City and the surrounding boroughs showing heat-related mortality, not specific to pregnancy, but um, just in general. And you can see that certain neighborhoods have higher risks for heat. And why is this? Is you know, there's differences in tree cover and there are differences in the proportion of uh, the uh, environment that's concrete. Um, if you look at the left, there was this group um, out of Mailman that went around in one of the more recent heat waves and measured the ambient temperature outside using these handheld devices. So the 
picture on the bottom is from the Upper East Side, um, tree lined streets, brownstones, a neighborhood there where the during the heat wave, the ambient temperature was me measuring 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That same day, you know, a mile away um, in the middle of Harlem, the ambient temperature was measuring 126 degrees. So huge differences, even in you know, our own backyard um, with implications to our patients, depending on where they live. Um, as obstetricians, I think we've gotten much better about screening for things like food insecurity and housing insecurity, but not so for energy insecurity. And I think as the climate warms, this will become increasingly important. So people may or may not have indoor cooling uh, devices, uh, unlike heating, which is required by law, um, uh, indoor cooling is not. Um, but even if they do have an indoor cooling uh, device, an air conditioner or window unit, they may not have resources to pay for utilities. Um, and so the more you ask about this, you recognize that people's indoor um, temperatures are probably not uh, equitably distributed. Um, and so we need to be better about thinking through that. And as the collaborative, we were able to, working with our uh, partners at, at Mailman at School of Public Health, provide some resources so that if a patient screens positive for energy insecurity, we can provide them with city-based resources that uh, help with utility um, payments, provide window um, cooling units if you don't uh, have them as well. Just like air pollution, we also put together some fact sheets to provide you know, clinicians with something um, that you could give uh, your patients. What, is, you know, what does heat do during pregnancy? What are some simple things um, that they can do to reduce their exposures? So that's, again, a little bit of background on me and how my own career has um, developed over time. But now I want to spend the last bit of this talk giving you some updates on the collaborative and what we've been up to over the first two years. Um, more detail you can find on our website, um, which is in the departmental websites under the research tabs. But you can just Google uh, CWEH Columbia or Columbia uh, Women's Environmental Health, and you'll find it that way too. Uh, I've showed a couple of, of the fact sheets that we've put together. We started with um, exposures and their impact on pregnancy outcome um, and have translated these to Spanish. We have them on air quality and heat, as I mentioned, but also some plastic exposures, consumer products, marijuana, vaping, e-cigarettes, um, some forever chemicals you may have heard about, PFAS and lead. Um, our next kind of uh, uh, plan is to start uh, putting out some fact sheets related to fertility because a lot of uh, a lot of these same exposures that can cause adverse uh, pregnancy outcomes can impact fertility. So being able to, to work with our um, REI division to modify these fact sheets and make them useful for their uh, patient population as well. Another initiative that we've done is we partnered with the departmental postpartum doula program. So this program um, is available to some of our most vulnerable patients and the, the doulas go out to the homes uh, in the immediate postpartum period, giving them lots of education and support in those first weeks. We've been doing education with our doulas about some of these key environmental exposures and how they might look around and, and ask questions um, uh, of uh, their clients and be able to connect them to resources in the, in the city uh, to improve their environment. Um, they may not realize some of their rights as renters um, around uh, issues like lead. And so that's been something we've uh, been working on um, over uh, over the different seasons, we've uh, tried to uh, talk to these these key environmental exposures. Um, also recognizing, again, I think when I first came back to Columbia, climate change, while important, didn't seem to be to be as looming as it is, but it really became the elephant in the room and something that the university is very 
uh, focused on and has significant strengths. And so I think as a collaborative, we wanted to figure out what's the academic OBGYN um, initiative around climate change that we should be thinking about. Um, we started by, you know, trying to collect information and put it out there to educate clinicians around um, these climate related factors that could impact pregnancy health. So um, Dr. Dalton uh, was able to have us do a seminars in perinatology issue where we took those kind of all of those different factors and, and uh, had review chapters on all of the all of that uh, to get again in front of the OBGYN audience. Why is it that climate change is important and what is it doing to pregnancy health? Uh, my own interest, uh, again, research wise has really been in, in the international settings. Columbia has been part of something called the Global Network for over 22 years. Um, and what we're doing now is leveraging all the amazing data and different interventional studies that have been done over time, looking back to see if any of those interventions actually mitigate um, the effect of heat on pregnancy. So there was a study looking at early optimal nutrition, pre-pregnancy, and in the first trimester, we were able to show that heat negatively impacts birth size, but yet in those women who were randomized to optimal nutrition, it um, almost eliminated that effect of heat on the pregnancy. And we're doing something similar right now, um, looking at the effect of aspirin. Can aspirin um, reduce the negative impact of heat on pregnancy outcomes? Um, we had a great time, if that's the right word, in June hosting a climate emergency preparedness workshop for maternal child health providers in, in and around New York City. So recognizing that climate change is happening now, things like heat waves, wildfires, um, flooding, hurricanes are already here. We need to be prepared as an OBGYN, OBGYN department, ours and others around the city, how are we going to respond when those disasters strike? And I think all of us um, who you know pay attention to the news realize that this is not the future, but it's happening now. The hurricanes um, that we saw in the, this past month and their impact um, far from where the the landfall of the hurricane hit in the flooding in North Carolina, the impact that had on IV fluid. Uh, uh, availability uh, around the country is really impressive. And so, you know, I think that this was a workshop that was uh, incredibly helpful as we began to think through, are we prepared for these emergencies? Um, so we, you know, brought together, like I said, um, uh, individuals who, uh, from hospitals that had childbirth services, uh, as well as people from the New York City Department of Health, some, uh, some, uh, key educators from the CDC, and really began to think through how do we shelter in place in an emergency? How do we deal with surges if other hospitals are on divert? And how do we evacuate? Um, again, going home a little bit in a panic, if you will, but recognizing that there was work to be done. Um, the tabletop exercise that we used was a little bit unbelievable on some, um, it, with some respect, just because we put all the emergencies together at once. So a heat wave comes in, the grid goes down, a hurricane hits, lower Manhattan floods. Here's the picture of that. Um, and so uh, none of these things are unbelievable alone. The situation unfolding over three or four days is a bit uh, unbelievable, but I think it really helped us uh, solidify what we were uh, hoping to become more prepared in the future. We had great uh, representation over 18 hospitals in the city, both uh, big systems, academic systems, public health systems. Um, it was really a great day. Another initiative we've done is really recognizing that um, the... Why are they the children are the future, if you will. They're not really children, but um, that trainees, there's so much idealism uh, amongst our residents and fellows. Um, and so we had an open call for people who wanted to, to spend some 
extra time outside of their regular day jobs, learning more about climate change, sustainability and health. And here's our inaugural class, which includes two OBGYN residents. Um, and we come together monthly with outside speakers um, and really just a community of learners trying to understand how climate change impacts their, uh, their medical discipline. Each of them will complete over their two years some sort of mentored project, whether that's traditional research, whether it is um, a sustainability uh, initiative, uh, or an educational uh, type of uh, uh, something to, to, to get the word out, so to speak. And finally, I'll end that we really are trying to do a better job on sustainability um, and what, you know, what we can contribute as a department to efforts uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. It's, it's thought that um, in the United States, uh, hospitals and healthcare account for 8 to 10% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions, and that therefore, if we are really to make um, a dent in that uh, nationally, that we too need to be involved. Columbia has set very uh, ambitious goals and targets, and uh, the medical campus at this point lags behind uh, the Morningside campus and getting closer to our targets. Um, we often think about, you know, this being something that the hospital has to do, but what is it that a, a you know, a department can do? What, what part can we play? We focused initially on making sure that we were sorting waste appropriately. Um, the red, uh, the regulated medical waste or the red bag waste, um, you know, contributes to huge greenhouse gas emissions as it has to be incinerated. And a lot of times people um, just place regular old trash there because of where the the, uh, the trash bin is located. So we did some education, relocation of uh, trash bins, um, you know, again, to try to, to decrease our own um, contributions to this and have, uh, you know, have designs on other initiatives that we might um, be able to do as a department and uh, partnering again with the hospital to uh, make this more important all around uh, and more visible. And I'll end with this. I think that, you know, uh, again, my ex experience when I got dragged from the cooking fires into this environmental pediatric world is just this recognition that there's this huge gap. There's tons of research going on in the public health schools. There's a lot of focus on this from policymakers, but there's a real gap between that and, and, met, and medicine, the patient doctor encounters. What do we tell people without scaring them completely to death, giving them practical uh, advice that actually might decrease their exposures and recognizing that a lot of their exposures are out of their control. So how do you do this in a way that doesn't put the blame on their shoulders? Um, it's not easy and I don't know that I completely have the answer, but I think it's something um, that as uh, clinicians and OBGYNs, we really need to be focusing on moving forward. So in summary, I do think the environment matters uh, as it accounts for the majority of disease risk. It helps explain disparities in disease incidence and outcomes of a, among different types of our patients. It's potentially modifiable, and I think that's the most exciting thing. Um, we may be unable to solve our biggest challenges in our fields without addressing these con uh, these contributors to, to, to health. And I have sitting on my bedside table these two books. One's called Our Uninhabitable Earth, and it's a little depressing. Um, but factual, it gets you motivated to, to, to begin to lean in, uh, to this space. But then I found this other book that I've really, really come to like, and it's around climate change and the challenges of climate change. But the title is what if we get this right? Um, and it sort of throws out there that yes, we are in a pickle, if you will, but it allows us to reimagine the world and we might, we have the opportunity to get it right. And that's kind of what inspires me um, to keep uh, working in this space. And I will stop there and turn it over to you all. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you to, for, to Dr. Dalton for allowing me to 
uh, to build something like this. Um, we couldn't do it without the support of individuals like you all. And uh, it's really been the opportunity of a lifetime. Well, you, I think you can see how um, excited I was to get Blair back and uh, and uh, see her develop something that's pretty unique in a department of OBGYN. There is one other unit in the, uh, the University of uh, UCSF in San Francisco. Um, and I've been asking Blair if we could write something simple together, like we could just say, what is the prescription for an OBGYN department? to um, it, how could they start to really tackle some of and educate their departments about uh, the impact of the environment and learn about it. And, um, and Blair has such a knowledge in this. I think it would be, uh, it would be a tool that could be used by OBGYN departments to at least put a little foot in the door and have the information necessary to improve the health of their patients. So, um, uh, I, you know, I, I think her, what she said about public health, knowing so much about this and being so into it and not being translated clinically is exactly what Blair's role has been. And her ability to do that has been fantastic. So Blair, I know you'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah. I see Joni as a very nice um, compliment to you in the chat and, uh, um, and was fascinated about this. If anyone has any questions, they're welcome to come on camera and ask or put them in the chat. And many of you are still listed as participants. So if you want to uh, put your camera on so we can see who participants are, that would be great. Um, Hi, Cynthia. How are you? Hey, how are you? Um, that was a really, really interesting presentation, Blair. Thank you. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one is uh, I have two daughters of childbearing age, and I wanted to know to what extent use of beauty products, hair products, moisturizers, uh, you know, uh, uh, anything, any personal products, um, is has an impact on an unborn child, a fetus. And the other question is, have you found microplastics? Does, has anyone found microplastics in little ones, to be little children? I'll start, I'll start with the second one, then go back to the first one. So um, we have, there have been a couple of studies looking at microplastics in the placenta and in the amniotic fluid. Um, and in cord blood and have found them. So uh, the microplastics are in our bloodstream and they're getting across to the fetus. What they're doing, I think we still don't quite exactly know um, what, you know, what the potential impact of those microplastics are, but they are getting across, uh, across the placenta. Um, personal care products, um, the exposure that we think about the most from things like cosmetics and shampoos is something called phthalates. The other big place that you have exposure to phthalates is from fast foods. Just think through kind of the tubing that the fast food uh, is produced. Um, and there's a big literature emerging on toxic beauty. You might have seen this in um, in, you know, the lay press as well, especially on, um, some of the really, uh, you know, hair straighteners and, uh, some of the, the products that are used. And I think what is, you know, again, this challenge of, of translation is that we do know that these exposures are associated with harm. What is the threshold um, how do you, you, you know, you don't go through pregnancy and not shampoo or not, um, you know, soap your body up. And so what is the actual correct message to give someone? Um, there's something called the environmental working group, and they put out lists of sort of, you know, phth phthalate free or more approved, uh, products. And so, uh, happy to share some of those resources with you um, as well. 
But again, what happens um, from a consumer product is often, you know, something is the phthalate is removed and then there's a replacement chemical that's been even less studied that's in the same class. Um, so like BPA free, if you go to the, you know, if you go to the grocery store, they'll be marketing all sorts of products to you as being bisphenol A free, but the replacement chemical is BPB or BPC, which may be the exact same, doing the exact same thing. So again, there's a lot to be learned in how do we translate this messaging without making people just, um, you know, afraid to live in the real world. <laughs> Not easy. Thank you. So, so the environmental working group. Um, how would you find their resources, or could could you drop it in the chat? Maybe? Yeah, I will. Uh, I think I can just Google. And if I don't find it quickly, I can. We'll send it out afterwards. No worries. Yeah. yeah Thanks we can so much for your response. Yeah. No, we'll send it to you. I was just thinking that could be her next. Uh, one of her next uh, pamphlets for put on our website so we know about beauty products because that's not, it's becoming a very common question. Uh, one question, Blair, that I get asked a lot, and I personally have um, taken your advice on this by now, not drinking as much um, uh, water from plastic bottles and getting glass bottles. And I actually recommended it to um, our donor who supported you um, and this collaborative in our department. And um, he said, oh, well, I always drink tap water, but his wife drinks the plastic. So now she's off the plastics as well. So if you would talk about drinking from plastic bottles and also drinking uh, well water. Two important questions. So I think that when it comes to plastics, the most dangerous thing is actually microwaving or heating food or water in plastic. So, um, you know, a lot of us use microwaves to get our food or for our children uh, to warm things up. And I think that the biggest thing I learned was that's a, a, a no, no. And so microwaving on, you know, ceramic or other uh, non-plastic alternative is probably important. Storage of food in non-plastic. So in metals in the refrigerator, so that you don't have things leaching into uh, the food and probably, you know, again, um, drinking from uh, non-plastic would be also on that list, but lower than, uh, than microwaving in plastic. I think all of us as a society need to figure out actually how to reduce our plastic waste in general. That contributes to greenhouse gas emissions as well. So it will decrease our footprint and not only improve our, our health. The second question that you asked was about well water. Um, well, you know, if someone is using well water as their primary drinking source, it's just important for them to think about testing it. The exposures that come in well water that we don't think about from, from our own municipal source, which is New York City has one of the cleanest water um, uh, available in the country. It's one of a, a real point of pride. But well, well water can have exposures to heavy metals that you're not aware of as well as, as the perfluorinated alkyl substances, the PFAS, depending on where you are. Um, so uh, if someone is actually using well water, it's probably worth having it tested for some of those common contaminants. They may be, you know, their well may be perfect, um, but it may not be. I definitely had to do that in Vermont and full of uh, a lot of metals there. So no wonder it tastes so bad. I'm glad I had mine tested. Um, <laughs> So Blair, another thing was, um, what would you say are the most critical environmental factors that um, currently impact women's health um, during pregnancy and beyond? You mentioned some of them, but like if you could order them. Oh, that's a great question. Sorry. It, no, it, it's a, it's a thought provoking question and it's hard to answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, you know, again, I think that that should be the focus of additional research because the way that research is done is you have you know someone who's picked a contaminant of an interest and they look at 
um, the, you know, the effect sizes of that particular exposure, and then they go on to something else, but we need to be putting it all together. So, you know, what's the priority if, you know, um, you can't go live in a bubble, is it better to switch out your shampoo to a phthalate three phthalate free product, or does it make more sense to focus on, um, you know, eating organic to reduce your exposures to, to pesticides. And I don't, I don't have the answer. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's the question that, that clearly underscores that you're a clinician, right? And I think that those are the questions that we need to be posing to our public health colleagues. Like, you know, you can't have it all. Um, what's the, the what's the importance? What are the priorities? What do you do in your own life and family? I never asked you that question before. <laughs> well, interestingly, I got interested in this after I had already had my two children. Mm. <laughs> so um, part of it was a little bit of like, whoops, I guess it's too late. And I, I do think that there are periods of our life where this matters more. Um, you know, again, I think that reproductive years are very crucial early childhood is very crucial. So I, you know, I began thinking about how I was feeding my children and what, you know, containers I was using, but I'd sort of passed through my own reproductive. And now I've sort of said, you know, it's not that I'm, you know, neglecting my own health, but I think that um, it's definitely made me think twice about uh, heating things in plastic. That's good. Thank you. And I, the plastic, storing them in plastic also is so common. That's, that's very yeah. good advice. Thank you. Um, and then how does air quality and chemical exposure influence um, maternal and fetal outcomes? Just quickly. You know, I mean, I think that there's only a few things, the, the same adverse outcomes happen with all of these things. So preterm birth, uh, impacting fetal growth, um, probably early reproductive loss, like miscarriage is a big one that we need to tackle um, with respect to environmental exposures. Those are the big ones. Hypertension is related to some, but not all environmental exposures as well. Well, we're at time. Um, and uh, Joni has a message in here, uh, informing teenage girls of these risks before they become pregnant, um, kind of aligns with uh, Cynthia's question. Uh, <laughs> I, I would think... say my teenage girl probably won't listen to to my advice, but maybe uh -huh. other teenage girls might listen to the advice. Um, so if you step outside of your own family. <laughs> so we will follow up on that um, with you, Cynthia, and, um, and, and the rest of the uh, people on tonight. Uh, all of you, thank you very much for joining. Any last questions, any requests from us? Um, sorry about the Zoom. I'm not sure what happened earlier that uh, you were not listed appropriately, but I'm sure we'll get that fixed for next time. Sarah or Joni, anything to finish? No, I thought it was a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I'm obviously I'm interested and if you feel environmental, um, everything environmental affects dementia and as you age, you know, things that you can do. I mean, besides not using plastic teeth things and things like that, but I would imagine there probably is quite an effect. And um, there's a real opportunity there, I think, um, you know, at Columbia and for researchers, we've been involved uh, with something called the uh, Columbia Children's Environmental Health Center and have been following families for almost three decades. And so have some of those exposures when those women were pregnant in their 20s and 30s. And there's been some uh, efforts to try to uh, re-enroll, if you will, the, the mothers in their you know, midlife and look at questions about exposures uh, during their reproductive years, exposures currently, and how that's impacting cognitive development. So uh, I think you're on to something very important there, and maybe I should be paying more attention um, to those kinds of issues. Well, I think you've been busy enough, Blair, and uh, you've accomplished a ton in a very short period of time. So we look forward to 
watching your career and uh, seeing what else you do. Um, very Thank you to all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, Sarah, as always, you uh, you push us to the next level. So thank you. And uh, thank you all very much. We're a little bit over time. We start a little bit late because of our Zoom issues. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And um, uh, we'll be sending a note to all of you for Thanksgiving. Um, and it's hard to believe that we're at the end of October already. And uh, Thanksgiving will be upon us in just a few weeks. So. Um, thanks very, very much to everyone for our development team for putting this on and uh, for all of you for joining. I can't thank you enough. And again, Blair, well done, as always. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Bye.